morning, everybody, and thanks for uh, the comrades of Syriza and of uh, Resistance for inviting me. Look, I'm going to try uh, to situate the struggle of the Greek people in uh, a wider, the global frame. Um, I do not believe that the struggle of the Greek people is just a struggle for another local Greek economic policy other than austerity with a view to contributing to reduce at least the debt and so on. Nor is it a struggle uh, for, in that frame, for a change or uh, some change in the European policies at the European level. No, I think it's far more than that. It is the, the Greek people are, is, are facing in their struggle the major challenge of our time, the major, the big challenge. It is not to try to move the choice being, is it have we to try to move out of the crisis of capitalism, of that crisis of capitalism? Um, and here in that frame of that crisis of the Euro system and of the European system, or we have to move out of capitalism in crisis. It's something very different. I don't believe and I don't mean moving out of capitalism in crisis is having the beautiful revolution with a capital R uh, within 24 hours and the next day uh, we are in a, a paradise, a socialist paradise. I mean only a series of revolutionary actions and advances one preparing possibly the other and moving us out gradually, gradually from capitalism. And that will take long, long time, not months or years, not even decades, but perhaps more than decades, perhaps a century. Now, that is the challenge. Now, first point, what is the capitalist, the global system today? And I will look at one, some general features with respect to that global capitalist system of today, and then some more particular features of its sub-European subsystem. say. One, we can call it late capitalism. I don't mind much, provided that we qualify what me, we mean by late, which could mean everything and nothing. I mean by late capitalism, and I don't use that uh, vocabulary, but anyway, it's not, my, it's not the point, is a, is a stage of generalized mo domin monopoly or monopolies, globalized and financialized. I mean by generalized that we have reached a point of the, in the centralization, concentration, not of property, not of property of capital, but of the control of capital, a level which has made a small group of Enormous monopolies practically control everything, which means that all economic activities have been de facto transformed, put into, um, um, uh, 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 reduced to the status of de facto subcontractors of monopoly capital. And that is new. Monopoly is not new. It has started more than a century ago, but that is new. It has started only 
something like 40 or 50 years ago, or even less. Now, the, uh, this process of this, this change in the uh, structure of monopoly capital has led or is leading or is synonymous to the systematic dismantling of the economic productive systems, plural, which were more or less national systems, economic productive national systems, dismantling it without replacing uh, this, uh, the logic of those dismantled systems by any type of logic ruling the global or even sub-global such as the European system. The European system has destroyed the European economies without replacing them by an European economy, singular. That is a system, a, 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 a stage in which uh, the dismantling of the system is not a step in the rebuilding or in building beyond a new stage of, uh, of, lo or, or of development of capitalism. Now, the exclusive target of such a system is the opening of the market exclusively for the expansion of those monopolies. It is uh, destroying in that way. I mean, I think Spain, perhaps Greece even, but Spain is more typical. What has been, what had been uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the, um, uh, <coughs> the mechanism for the success, capitalist success of Spain during the uh, past previous not the 20 last years, but the 30 years before, high rates of growth, it was precisely the creating of a network of an economic Spanish productive system with middle and small, and many middle and small enterprises. A monopoly uh, globalization through the European system has destroyed systematically that to open the market to exclusively monopolies, whether Sp Spanish or others, and more others than Spanish or associated. And that was the disaster, which has led to the ongoing crisis. Now, that process of systematic dismantling of the national systems which had been built historically, more or less, as I said, as national, even in uh, 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 national Lato sense, without giving any uh, very precise meaning to the, to the world. To the, uh, um, with respect to the uh, majority of the people of the planet for the south, the three continents of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the, uh, is synonymous to the accelerated dismantling of the peasant uh, family agriculture to the benefit of uh, agro-business and so on uh, with land grabbing and uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. That is a process of massive pauperization. So we, if we add all that together, what we see is that we have reached at the global level a stage of capital accumulation which leads to a massive accelerated global pauperization. I'm not, say, I'm not speaking only of growing uh, uh, inequality in the distribution of income, but massive pauperization. Uh, the uh, thought of Marx about relating pauperization to accumulation is not only 
found together today, but is probably 10 times or 100 times more severe than what Marx ever imagined about the processes of pauperization at the global level. Now, that operates everywhere, but unequally, a little less dram dramatic in the advanced center, more dramatic in the peripheries of the advanced centers, such as Greece or Spain, and of course, much more dramatically in the real peripheries in the south. Now, I'm submitting that at the present stage of history, capitalism cannot be different from what it is. That is the idea that we could, uh, through a process of reforms, etc., uh, change the rules uh, in favor of a new or new historical compromises between the uh, working classes and monopoly capital on the one hand, between the various partners unequal in the global system, a, such a compromise is has at the present level of centralization of the control of monopoly capital become impossible. So any policy based on that perspective of capitalism with a human face and etc. etc. or uh, reducing poverty or uh, uh, reducing polarization at the global level or at sub-regional or regional levels is absolute illusion. Capitalism cannot be different from what it is today. Now, moving from this general uh, qualification of the system to the European Union, and the euro within the European Union. In that, in that perspective, we should see and understand that the European Union is a building block of that global monopoly, generalized monopoly capitalism. It is not something else. It's a building block of that. It has been systematically constructed in a very rational way and systematic and systematic to uh, service that those purpose. As uh, Giscard d'Estaing uh, said, uh, the constitution of Europe makes socialism illegal. Illegal. We are illegal in Greece because you want socialism. You want something which is not acceptable by the Constitution, because that Constitution considers that the sacrosanct private property, which means de facto the property of monopoly capital, not of other people, that is of no importance, not of peasants, not of small enterprises, that is of no importance, but the, monopoly, the pro private property of monopoly capital is beyond, above the law, above the, any demand of any people. So democracy is abolished. Abolished. It has its limit at that point. We should, you should know that. Uh, the Greek people, as all the European people, has developed gigantic illusion throughout the past 20, 30, 40, 50 years about uh, a new Europe, even a not good Europe is, is better than no Europe. And a bad Europe can be gradually changed into a better Europe, etc., etc. They have completely missed the point that it had been conceived from the very start. And if I had the time, I would go to Monet, who was, who was a fascist, not a democrat, huh? not, uh, vicious, uh, uh, and to, uh, uh, who, who were at the root of the European project 
as an anti-socialist project, not just uh, in the frame of the Cold War of the time, etc., but forever. Now, um, well, I just want to give a symbol. What is this shame Europe chaired by this civil servant of Luxembourg who has for his exclusive service during his whole life was the service of a uh, fiscal paradise. That is the chairman of Europe. It's a shame for the European people. I would have never imagined 20 years ago that the European peoples, and I say peoples, not the governments, would accept to go such low, such low to accept such a small person, mediocre civil servant servicing, uh, 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 transforming money from mafias to etc. That that would be the chair, and you have to negotiate with such a man, such a person. Shame. Now, conclusion uh, of that uh, of that paragraph. Greece cannot achieve a revolutionary advance, not a revolution, some advance towards, towards socialism. For me, socialism, communism is a higher stage of human civilization. It will take still centuries to reach it, but no less than that. But we have to start without, in, and, and remain at the same time in the perspective of remaining within the Eurozone and even within the European Union. No. You have to understand that any step ahead needs moving out of this, those straight jackets. Third point, this system is not viable and anyway is already imploding in a variety of forms and uh, with a variety of results, some good, other not so good or even bad, but it is imploding. It is not viable. One, why is it not viable? Because at the economic level, uh, this level degree of concentration of the control of capital uh, to the benefit, to the exclusive benefit, without uh, compromise with others, of uh, a handful of uh, monopoly capital, leads to a permanent um, stagnation within the very centers of the system. I'm not uh, so fond of growth for itself or many other reasons, but that's not the point. Capitalism cannot survive without growth. And uh, uh, this system of this exclusive monop the, the monopoly of power to the exclusive benefit of those generalized monopolies lead to a permanent stagnation. The average rates of growth for the triad United States Europe and Japan, which were on the average between 1945 and 1975, 5% per annum, has fallen brutally as of 1975 to half of it, 2.5%, and now it is even less than that on the average, and has never recovered since. It means that that stage of concentration and centralization of the control of monopoly capital is not viable. Now, it is also not viable because the effects of its de 
a systematic destruction of all the national productive systems and all which was going along with that, which means the welfare state, which means this and that, whatever it was at various degrees, means a permanent and deepening process of pauperization. Now, along with growing inequalities, but growing inequalities and growing scandalous inequalities not related to innovation in the productive systems. And that is what makes that inequality even less legitimate if it had any, at any time, point in time, any legitimacy. But it was looked at or considered more or less acceptable and legitimate to the extent that it was related to real innovation leading up the uh, average, uh, the level of productivity of the uh, economic system. It is no more that. It is also not viable for a series of other reasons, uh, no, no less important, such as the ecological systematic destruction, etc. And therefore, it is un not viable politically. And this is why it cannot survive except by using more and more two instruments. One, permanent war. And that is the strategy chosen by the U.S. and followed by the European lackeys, and I say lackeys, as a systematic policy for, re for the control of Asia, Africa, and eventually uh, recuperating the control of Latin America. And that is one tool, systematic war, and you cannot understand anything of what is happening not far from here in the Middle East, in the Arab and Middle East, but around, you can understand nothing what is happening or prepared in East Asia and in, in the West Pacific, if not, if not understanding that this capitalism at that stage has no other means to tame the permanent, not only revolt of the peoples, but also resistance and positive and successful resistance of states or of a number of states of the South. And the second tool is to move, goodbye to democracy, long live fascism return to fascism. And uh, this is welcome. It's the only means. Monet, the, who founded the European Union, was a fascist. He said his sympathy went to uh, Mussolini and even to Hitler. Even to Hitler. You see? And that is the model of democracy. Now, um, and we have seen it, we see it, how uh, in Ukraine, for instance, the alliance of the European and global capitalism with local Nazis has been decisive in the uh, events uh, around in, in Ukraine. Now, second point, this system is already is already imploding um, uh, precisely for all those reasons which it's not viable. Therefore, you know, when, it, uh, when after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall and the fall and the uh, breakdown of Soviet Union, 1919-91, end of history, capitalism is here forever, capitalism is able to adjust to any a change for the future of uh, humankind, etc., etc. All this nonsense did not did not uh, um, um, survive in many years. Uh, very very quickly, as of the mid 90s, already uh, 
and we have seen it starting in Latin America, precisely the movements of the people rejecting the consequences of this uh, uh, turn in history. Now, uh, the uh, implosion, as have yesterday, uh, the Vice President Linera and our friend from Venezuela gave a uh, very splendid uh, presentation of what has been achieved, revolutionary advances, not revolution, but revolutionary advances, positive uh, in their countries, uh, Bolivia and Venezuela, but it could be said also to various degrees and with many nuances in some other countries of Latin America. I'm not speaking of Cuba, of course. Mm? Uh, as examples of what has been uh, a positive response or inscribing itself in the implosion of the system in a positive way. But in another way, China as the only I would say the only really emerging country is also, is also a part of the implosion. Its success is part of the implosion. I don't want to go into that subject because uh, being too short on that subject would lead to misunderstandings uh, which I, I want to avoid. And to lesser degree, but nonetheless some degree, those other countries whether we like their political regime or not, here and, and there in the South, such as the so-called uh, BRICS, among others, but China in particular. What is common? And then you have, of, of course, a lot of uh, uh, explosions, uh, revolts of people, and yours, the Greek one is part of it, uh, which, uh, and we have seen it developing relatively recently in some Arab countries, which have led to nothing, or to very little, or to things which are a mixture of progress and regressions, very complicated, but which is only the beginning of the movement. You know, I summarize it by what I read on the walls of Cairo, which is beautiful. It is written on the walls of Cairo, the revolution, the people call it so, has not changed the system, but it has changed the people. And that means a lot for the future. Um, now, what is in common to all that those who succeeded and those who failed. Those who succeeded, succeeded because they were able to develop a sovereign project. And that has been beautifully presented yesterday uh, for Bolivia and Venezuela. It could be presented for other countries, whether we like them or not. Uh, <clears throat> it could be presented for China, a sovereign project which means precisely a national project of building systematically a modern productive system. I don't like the word modern, but it's a system. Industrialized and modernized, articulated with uh, a renewal of uh, uh, and modernization of peasant family uh, agriculture and conceived as a system which distribute the result of the growth to the vast majority, ideally the whole people. I call it a sovereign, national, popular project. You see, I'm not using the word socialist. A national, sovereign, popular, which of course, being that, and to the extent that is that, is also a stage on the long road 
to socialism and communism and is also the frame creating the conditions for inventing and developing the democratization of the society. It is not accepting an a priori blueprint such as the Western blueprint, eh? multi-party ele uh, uh, electoral representative uh, democracy, which means uh, almost nothing. You can vote in Europe free, but uh, if you vote this or that, the next day you are being said that the parliament has no, has no uh, <coughs> rule has no um, um, weight because it's the market which decides. And if you vote against the market, then you are in illegality and you are in Greece, an illegal uh, election. Hmm? Uh, or a farce like we have in most countries of Asia and Africa. Now, This is the common, uh, the common ground, uh, uh, the, the common denominator, having a sovereign project. But what it means for Greece, Greece cannot have a sovereign project and remain in the Euro and European Union. I think, and I will come to that point, that after having voted you should have said to the Europeans, here is our project. Here is our project. Is it compatible with what you think are or should be or could be the rules of Euro and Europe? Yes, we negotiate. No, we negotiate our moving out. And we take immediately measures which put us in, strong, in a strong position. We establish control of capital flows. So if you take uh, measures against us, we block your, your debt, your funds here, etc. That would have been, could be, or should be, I think, uh, the, is the consequence of the logic of what I'm saying, that you cannot have a success, you cannot have, you are not tolerated to have a sovereign project and remain in the European Union. Because a sovereign project means moving even gradually out of neoliberal globalization and the European project is part and parcel of the global neoliberal uh, globalization pattern. So you cannot have both. Sovereign project and European Union. That is the uh, center of, I would think, should be the center of the debate. Now, out of that, what can be done, therefore, in, uh, in Greece? The illusion, Europe will accept to negotiate uh, no, and I think you, you will, unfortunately, will see that. Whatever are your proposal, whatever are your enormous concessions, they will say you have to capitulate. There is only one solution, total capitulation at no conditions. And... Uh, the gentleman, uh, the, which I, in French, je, je méprise, I don't know in English how you say despise. Hmm? despise. Despise totally this gentleman of Luxembourg. You should spit at his face and not negotiate with him. You would be understood by the European people. You would be understood. <laughs> now, what is the greatness of Greece is that you, Syriza, have had the audacity. And you have proven 
that by having the audacity that is to develop precisely a proposal of a reasonable, clever, sovereign project adjusted to the conditions of your country. You had the audacity to present it. You have won. The lesson was understood in, 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 in Spain. Podemos had the audacity. It has won. But we see also nobody in France, in Germany, in Britain having such audacity. The result is that either the voices are taken by fascists and the right is very happy with that. And when I'm saying the right, I include the socialists among them. Or by uh, some uh, uh, non understandable uh, situation such as the one, the curiosity of Britain today. But <coughs> um, Tariq will say much more on that, certainly. Now, you had this audacity and it has paid. Now you must continue to have it. That this is the only chance of winning. You can win. And that is the only chance to win. Otherwise, the plan of the Europeans is to destroy Greece. You know, in my life, twice, I felt myself not only in solidarity with, Greek, with the Greeks, but quasi a Greek in 45, 44. I was still a teenager, but I was living in Port Said when the um, Marines of the Averov wanted to come back in Greece to participate to the liberation with Eam and Elas, to whom we had all our heart was with them, the liberator of Greece. But the monarchy, the Greek monarchy, the British imperialist, the Egyptian monarchy don't, didn't want that. And they were hidden by friends, elders, who became later my comrades in the Communist Party, uh, hidden in Port Said. All of them were arrested, Egyptians and Greeks, by the British, the Greek fascists, and the e Egyptian at the, at, the, at the service. Now, that was my first admiration for the courage of Greece. Syriza was the second one, was the second one. Um, I had only mixed fe feelings before, even after the fall of the dictatorship and uh, the coming of, um, what, what, uh, of PASOK, hmm? because precisely PASOK developed very quickly this European illusion uh, and I thought that this was a historical tremendous mistake. Greece could have remained out, after all, a little like Norway, say, and say, well, we'll see. We are not uh, necessarily against you, but we are not going to implement, uh, move in like that with no conditions. Now, If my conclusion, my conclusion in, in a few, the world has always changed curiously, starting from its peripheries. Even capitalism, if, if I had time, started from the European peripheries and not from the centers of China, India, and the Middle East of that time. Uh, Socialism, if we call it so, started from the peripheries, whether the so-called weak link, Russia, China, and uh, with all the ambiguities of national popular liberation movements, 
And even within the center, it started whenever there is something important from Greece, from Spain, not from Germany or Britain or France or even Sweden. Now, we had this during the non-aligned movement, which I call non-aligned movement on globalization, globalization of that time, not the Cold War, which was enormous changes, enormous and positive, whatever have been their limits in the South, and no alliance, no support from anybody in the North. The people of the North, unfortunately, men kept solidar in solidarity with their imperialist leaders. And that was, to a large extent, the drama of the Russian Revolution, the drama of the Chinese Revolution, the drama of the national liberation of Asia and Africa, the drama of the attempts of uh, uh, liberation in Latin America. Are we going to have this repeated? That is, again, the world starting changing from the south, Lato Sensu, which includes the east also, uh, and nothing happening in the north, in the centers. I think here the European comrades have a gigantic responsibility. Be audacious like Syriza has been. That is the only way for the European to participate in a meaningful future of history. Thank you.